Hello again. I thought today I'd give another preview of my forthcoming novel, Hill 112. This is the novel about D-Day and the battle for Normandy. Now, I'm speaking in April. The novel's coming out late in May, I think right about the 23rd of May, um, just before the, the build-up to the commemorations of the, the 80th anniversary of the D-Day landings. Now, I've talked in earlier videos about what the novel's intended to do, that sense of giving a, an idea of what it was like, both for those who've already got an interest, but also for those who don't want to um, read a lot of non-fiction history to get some sense, some understanding of what was involved when we talk about D-Day and the, the subsequent fighting, and also then the inspiration behind it, why I was moved to write that. Now today I thought I'd talk a little bit about the characters, because obviously they're vital. Now, Books I've written in the past, the, the Vindolanda stories, the Napoleonic series, they're basically adventure stories. Adventure stories need a hero or heroes. And there's always something a little bit over the top, unnatural about most of the, the successful heroes. You know, they're either fantastically lucky in that they keep getting out of these escapades, even if they've got into them un unwillingly, um, or they, you know, they can always outfight, outthink, outsmart. They, they'll, they'll win in the end. And they don't necessarily have the, the characteristics that certainly I possess, but let alone, but most of the readers will possess. There, there's a sort of sense of we're reading about the sort of things that in some, to some respects we'd like to do, but also we think, well, some of these things are a little bit iffy. We don't want to go around killing all these enemies and all this sort of thing, um, seducing all these women and this sort of stuff. So the hero can be a little bit over the top. And it's interesting, Ian Fleming, about it, talking about his um, James Bond, said he didn't see him as a hero at all and rather described him as a, a blunt instrument wielded by a government department. And there's an element of that with Ferox. You know, there, there's aspects of him where he's probably not the most comfortable man to be around, but hopefully he's likable enough. But those are heroes, and it is rather artificial. It's part of the genre. Now, obviously, any novel is, by its nature, artificial. It can't be 100% accurate to real life because it would take too long and be rather dull. And, you know, you'll never, as a human being, understand entirely what everybody else is thinking anyway. With a book like Hill 112, where the idea is to give a sense of the reality, as strong a sense as possible, of the experience of the smells, of the fears, of the excitement, of the, the comradeship, of the humour, of the horrors of it all and of the, the hurry up and wait element that anyone who's ever worn uniform will, will recognize immediately. That sense you're, you're a tiny cog in a massive machine, in this case a military machine, and it gets things wrong, and even when it doesn't necessarily get things wrong, it can often be rather slow, and it doesn't tell you a lot of what's happening. So, you know, it was a, a characteristic thing when you're in the military in any form, you're either being told to do things faster, hurry up, get it done quicker than seems humanly possible, or you're just told to wait and it might be a new move before 12 o'clock or whatever um, they, the time happens to be, but it can also be uh, just that you're waiting because we don't really know what's happening next. So these odd mixtures in the, the same sense that, that combat can produce these moments of extreme danger, um, excitement, confusion, and an awful lot of hanging around, but with the tension knowing that something might happen at any stage, you just don't know when. There is always that element of, of danger lurking in the background. This is not a world for heroes. I mean, obviously, there are some exceptional individuals who prove to be superb fighters, superb soldiers, but I didn't want to write about the elite, in a sense, about the, the winners of the Victoria Cross, that sort of person, um, partly because, obviously, they're unusual. The, these individuals are rare. And I didn't want to write about elite units, so I'm not talking about a parachute battalion. I'm not talking about commandos. Um, you know, this isn't certainly not going into the sort of the Alistair McLean stuff of the picked men who go in and do this seemingly impossible mission and somehow get through. Um, those could be great stories, but that's very much a story that's back to the adventure genre. The idea of this novel is trying to be as accurate, trying to be as realistic as possible. So it's important that the characters are fairly normal. They're not superhuman. They might have moments where they do things that surprise themselves, remarkable things, but there are also moments of panic, of fear, you know, they will run away. Um, and they are not bulletproof in the way that the, you know, the, the heroes of the adventures tend to be, and that even if they get wounded, they sort of shrug it off very quickly. These are people who can get hurt and know they can get hurt. So that's part of it. But in the end, while this is a story about 
um, Normandy and the battle, obviously the characters have to speak to us. We have to like them. We have to want to know what happened to them. Be interested in them. Like is perhaps the wrong word. There'll be elements where they will do things and suffer things that I've never experienced directly and I, I expect that's also going to be true of most of the readers. You know, they're, they're under shell fire, they're in the middle of very intensive fighting and they cope and we might wonder well you know would we be able to cope at all the idea is not to put 21st century people myself or anybody else people with the attitudes and assumptions and the experiences of the modern world project them back put them in a 1944 battle dress uh sit one of them in the the commander's cupola of a sherman tank send them off to normandy and then imagine well how would i react how would this happen how would people today cope with this sort of thing because that really only tells you about your your attitudes to today it's important that they be people of their time and their era and their um part of society but they've got to be interesting i didn't want to write a novel where the 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 characters, in a sense, take over to the extent where the setting is almost irrelevant. So you can go for dramatic, you know, these are all um, people who are struggling with deep emotional crises within themselves about their identity, their sexuality, goodness knows what. It's not that sort of book. The war is a big enough drama to more than supply the needs of a book. It's the situation that matters. It's not really what's got them there. That's talked about in the novel. That's significant because we need to know who they are. But the novel starts on D-Day. It's not on D-Day, on the morning of June the 6th, 1944, with one of the characters in a, a landing craft um, off Gold Beach and two of the others back in, in Britain in one of the, uh, the camps where the, the army that's mustering to follow up uh, the invasion has been enclosed there and, and kept ready to move. This is the drama. The drama is that this is the, the opening of the Second Front. This is the landing in Hitler's fortress Europe. And these are three youngsters that are caught up in it. And they are young. That's one of the points to emphasize. The oldest is not quite 21. And remember, this is 1944. You, you come of age at 21. You can't vote until you're 21. These are three youngsters fighting for democracy, in a sense, who are not yet able to exercise any right to vote because they're too young. They are, all three of them, boys really, or young men, but they, they haven't experienced much life other than the war. They came to adulthood such as it is, and they became old enough to go into the armed forces during the Second World War. They were schoolboys in the 30s. They were still at school when the war began in 1939. So they've experienced the blitz and rationing and blackout and all of these things. They've grown up with it. And they've grown up with that sense of the war occupying, filling the horizon. You, know, you can't, this is a world where you can't really plan, oh, I want to be this, that, and the other, you know, this is my ambition in life, because you know that the probability is you've got, uh, you're going into one of the armed forces, all of these will choose or be put into the army, and you don't know whether you're coming out the other end, you don't know how long the war is going to last, you don't know what's going to happen to you, it's, it's a more dramatic thing, it's a more immediate priority to prepare yourself for coping with that than it is to think about, well, what am I going to do, how am I going to buy a house one day, have a family, all of this sort of thing. One of the main characters, James um, Taylor, is the oldest. He's the one who's you know, coming on for 21 in a few months' time, starts the book as a second lieutenant commanding a troop of Sherman tanks in a fictional armoured regiment. And he's the one on the landing craft on D-Day itself. So he's right into the action from the very start. He's recently got engaged. So there's that sense that there is a future. But it's also, he's someone who has been very much the, the captain of the cricket team they'd all played in at school. He's you know, pretty good looking. He's um, capable. He's bright. He's sensitive. He's got these dreams of being a writer, a poet, all of these sorts of things. But they're very vague. He's also still very young. He doesn't really know very much about life. There's a sense of he's someone who realizes he's playing a part. People expect him to behave in a certain way. They expect him to get engaged to the, the childhood sweetheart, which he's done. But he doesn't really know whether he wants to get married. He can't really imagine that sort of world, partly because he's sensitive enough to know that he might not make it that far. Or if he goes to war, how will he come back? Even if he comes back physically unchanged, what will it do to him? Uh, bear in mind, again, like all 
the other characters, these are the sons, the children of the First World War generation. So they know that war can be terrible, that it can be appallingly costly. And they don't have the naivety that some enlisting in 1914, 1915 um, possessed. They know this is going to be difficult, this is going to be unpleasant. They're also, they've been through those earlier stages of the war, they've heard the news of defeat after defeat after disappointment after uh, and, and failure. Um, you know, this isn't something easy. And while with hindsight we could look at 1944 and say, well, look, you know, if you look at the, the balance of resources, Hitler's Germany is so overstretched, it's bound to lose in the end. Well, yeah, the, the Second Front ought to succeed, but nobody knew that it would. You couldn't be absolutely sure. War is inherently uncertain. And there were lots of factors that could go wrong. And some that, you know, like the big storm that wrecked the, the American Mulberry Harbour and da severely damaged the British one in the aftermath in the, the later in June, the unexpected could happen. There are things you cannot control, no matter how much you've got in the way of resources and material and manpower. So they're less naive. So James is someone who is dealing with responsibility of giving orders that can lead to men dying and being wounded. And again, that's, that's a difficult thing for someone who is inclined to be very self-critical, to um, question everything they do, and is just unsure of himself. You know, he still feels he's playing a part. He's been educated this way. He's expected to be the dashing young leader, the, you know, the, the hero of a, a boy's own adventure, and yet he doesn't feel that's him. He doesn't really understand, and he's, he's slightly surprised that people are doing what he tells them to do. And he's learning to know the, the crew of his tank in particular, but more generally the men in his troop and the regiment as a whole. The, the bond between a tank crew of five was very, very close because they spend so much time cooped up in a very small place. And we'll talk more about tanks and tank warfare in future videos. You've got Mark Crawford, who is also a second lieutenant, in this case, commander of an infantry platoon in the, the Glamorganshire Regiment, a battalion of that, and fictional unit again, I've invented, so it's, it's easier to move them around and get them to the right places, and I don't have to be 100% accurate in terms of what happens to them and what happens on a particular day, what the casualties were at any time, details, nor am I, uh, can I be suspected of, of misrepresenting anybody, you know, uh, a real personality, and showing them in either a overly positive or overly negative way. These are all fictional. The, the characters within these units are invented. Mark is the, you know, the, the nice boy that people's parents and mothers particularly like, and he's he's, you know, quite quite good looking, quite bright, quite good at sport. Quite sums him up. There's a, a passage I, I'm rather fond of where you know Mark feels, is, is that all I'm ever going to be? Am I sort of quite good enough? He feels he's the the least favoured of his siblings. That his particularly his stern father doesn't really um, reckon much of him and doesn't expect much of him. His brothers were taller, better looking, more dashing, but you know one of them has already been severely scarred in a um, when his aircraft was shot down. Um, the other one is missing. You know the, there are. Um, there's a cost to this war that, again, is very obvious to him. His older brothers have already been through this, and he's not sure whether they're coming back. So Mark is, is again, a, a more uncertain man, but faces the similar problems if he has to give orders, and he doesn't, you know, isn't entirely sure he's got the... He's had the upbringing, and then he's had the military training that encourages him to be confident, to act quickly, you know, always be decisive, better to make a decision than, than just haver and do nothing. Um, at least you're doing something, do something positive. Again, he doesn't know. He doesn't know what this is going to be like. And then you've got Bill Judd, who is from the same form of, uh, prep school that they've all been, from the same victorious cricket team, who is another thinker. You know, they, these three are friends because they've got similar interests apart from sport. They like talking, they like ideas, they, they like literature, they like history, they like poetry, um, they like Shakespeare, they love all of these things and they've enjoyed their schooling and they've kept in some sort of touch. Judd, however, is the odd man out. His family, due to his father dying of, of TB contracted at the end of the First World War, he's had this sort of slow death where he couldn't work fully. The family's always struggled, they managed to put him to prep school, they couldn't afford to pay after that when the father died, so he's been to grammar school briefly and then he's left school at 14 and gone into an office in Cardiff, shipping office. So he's had a little bit of experience of work, but very much as the boy in the office. And he's desperate, he's a, he's a thinker, but he's, a, he's 
got a, a streak of awkwardness about him. You know, he's the, the sort of person who asks a difficult question, even when he doesn't really believe the case he's arguing, he will argue the awkward point, the, the contrary position to almost anyone he's talking to, just to sort of feel the ideas, to experience that, and also to assert himself. You know, there's a, a little bit of insecurity, the sense that he's got to prove himself on every occasion. He's a private in the Glamorganshire Regiment, same battalion as Mark, but in a different company, different platoon, so that he's carrying a Bren gun, he's the number one of a Bren team, and he is in the ranks so experiences that browned off, moaning, griping, <laughs> pitching element of um, soldiers everywhere. I think particularly the British Army, and perhaps I, I'm inclined to think particularly in a Welsh regiment, though actually I suspect it, it's pretty much standard of complaining about things of the sense of being you know, pawns in somebody else's game they don't really understand. Yes, they all think this is something that ought to be done, and yes, they've got that general sense, but they also know this is something they've got to go and do, and they, you know, while they might joke about working their ticket and trying to get a discharge and all this sort of thing, or some cushy post somewhere, actually they're, they're reasonably committed, um, and they will do it, but they're not, um, you know, blatantly patriotic or talking about the great cause or anything like that. It's, it's the, that's not their world. It's a world of a lot of bull, a lot of being... The idea was to make them representatives of their British society at that time. And they are not modern people projected back into 1944, which I fear is, is so often the case with the dramas and the fiction these days, and the same they'll do it for any period of history. And it, it rings false. Um, so I've tried to make them talk as people spoke at that time and not use modern idioms, which you know, it always annoys me and jumps out now um, when they start to use phrases that are just wrong or expressions or simply mannerisms. A lot of this has to do with manners, how you address each other. Now, obviously, this is partly uh, in the civilian context. This is still a very class-conscious society. That's even more true in the armed forces, where you have the rank structure, the distinction between officers, non-commissioned officers, warrant officers, uh, other ranks, you know, all, all of these different groupings, and the seniority within each of those groups. Um, that comes under pressure and can be slightly different in the, in the circumstances of, say, a tank crew compared to an infantry platoon, compared to the battalion back home before it's actually moved out and before it's embarked. So I've tried to get all of those things right. I've tried to make the way people express things. I, I've simplified some things like the um, the radio communication system used by the tank units and I've kept the same call signs for um, James and his tank and his troop and everybody else rather than changing them. They, they tend to change these things. The idea being to com you know, confuse the enemy a little bit, um, but also, as with a lot of British Army things, it's to confuse your own people as much as possible as well. Um, sorry, that's probably a legacy of having to learn BATCO back when I was in the, the OTC, which is an incredibly complicated code system that we got the impression nobody actually really used, but uh, there it was, and we, we studied the thing. Um, so sometimes I've simplified, and I've tried to make the, the language um, representative of the time, the attitudes representative of the time, not just impose modern um, sort of liberal 21st century ideas onto people in the 1940s, because it it's just would not ring true. I've tried to give the, the language, there's a lot more swearing in the book than, and it's, it's rather cruder than my normal style for my adventure stories where there's some but I try and keep it fairly mild because I you know in the end I think I'm writing for the the sort of you know 13 year old of most <laughs> most of us including myself in those adventure stories and it, it it might be nice if there's a few kids of that sort of age who do actually read it and I don't want to be uh, you know <laughs> getting them into the habit of swearing too strongly it's again it's however it's structured depending on who you are what class you're from your background and the situation so you know there's obviously it's cruder when you're, you're dealing with the men in the ranks and, and judd in particular is is living in that environment but also there are at times but there are there's a mixture there are some people who swear a lot and there are others who are hardly at all or don't um just as in real life 
and the nature of it. Again, there is a tendency where in a lot of modern um, adaptations where just everybody uses the F word all the time uh, for everything and there's no blasphemy, there's no other crudities at all. Um, that's, you know, that's, that's not how it was. That's, that's just that writers seem to have a limited vocabulary these days uh, and it doesn't ring true. So I've tried to mix everything up. Um, you know, I thought at one point, would I, should I do <laughs> the old fashioned way of dashes just so that I could let the, the 13 year old read this book. But I, in the end, I thought, no, that's, that seems a bit artificial in 2024 to be writing that way. So it's, it's all there. Um, I probably could have made it even cruder, but that's not the nature of this book. That's not these characters. Um, and it, it reaches the point you're trying to give with dialogue. Realistic dialogue is, is never that. It's always about giving a flavor, giving a sense that, yeah, that sounds about right. Gives an idea of who these people are, how they're behaving, how they're talking, how excited they are at the time. You know, are they really worked up? Is that why they're um, speaking this way? Are they, you know, and to reflect the, the other moods of the boredom and the moaning and all this sort of thing and the humor. Um, so I've tried to get everything right. I've tried to make these men of their times, uh, men of this situation, you know, they are in army units and again there is an etiquette that has to be followed. Um, you know, again one of the, uh, I mentioned the uh, the BBC series SAS Rogue Warriors um, in I think the Masters of the Air video and it, you know, it's got its moments but it it felt artificial, it felt that you were imposing modern attitudes and some were just wrong. There's a, a point where I think it's Sterling, who at the time is a captain, is told to F off by a corporal on sentry duty outside GHQ. And, you know, the, the corporal might make it very clear that you're not coming in, sir, but he isn't going to do that. That's not 19, what would it be, 1941, early 42, uh, British Army, because you can be put up on a charge for doing that sort of thing. And it's, you know, there are other ways to do this. And it's trying to understand some of that sense of how the army worked and of how someone of inferior rank can push insubordination, insult, contempt to the very limit, but not cross that line that can get them into trouble unless you're dealing with a situation where things have really broken down. Um, but in normal sort of everyday life, then you, you know, you've got to remember there are restrictions on what people can do. There is a very severe code of discipline and it's, it's imposed. Um, so I've tried to represent army life as accurately and the civilian life, because again, nearly all of these people are civilians in uniform. So uh, not just our main characters, but again, they haven't really had a real life uh, as adults before they've come into the army. Judd slightly, but again, he was just an office boy. Um, and the others, because they're simply too young. You know, that, that's the, the trick of fate has put them in the world at this time. So that's the idea. That's a little bit of a talk about what I'm trying to do with the characters. It's to show as much of the battle as possible from different perspectives. It's to represent the youngsters of that time and the, the older men of that time as well that are around them and their attitudes, because this is all about trying to give a sense of what happened, what it was like and who was there, rather than trying to, you know, just imagine you were a soldier in 1944, how would you have felt? I mean, it's the sort of essay question that even at common entrance level all those years ago, you would <laughs> have run miles from because it, it was it was nonsense. And, you know, it's basically asking for a, some creative piece about this is what I'd like, I'd feel like if I was a Saxon Husqvarna at Hastings and all this sort of stuff. It never really works. And it's, it's just false. And that's the idea of this book is to try and be as historically accurate as possible, as true to life as possible, even though it's a fictional story about invented characters. Um, so all of that was important. I hope what I've done is make these true to life for 1944. So that's it. Um, next month we'll probably do another one. I'm not sure whether we might look at the units or the British Army in 1944, or perhaps we'll look more generally at the Overlord and the D-Day campaign. We'll, we'll see how it goes, but don't worry for those who uh, prefer the other things. The next few talks are going to be Roman and um, after that some other ancient world things. So we'll see how it goes, but uh, see you next time. Thanks. Bye.